Thank you for the team leading us in that time of worship. As uh, we look at today's message, what it means, where we go in it all, one thing that you'll be aware of, we've been looking at my story, our story and his story. Coming to the end of the year now, we're pretty close to the end. Believe it or not, uh, today's a bit more of an Easter message uh, when we're actually coming into Christmas time. But as you know, we've been looking through the book of Luke and through the book of Luke, as we've been travelling through, obviously when we get to... That's better. Obviously when we get to the, uh, the end of the book, we're looking at what happens to Jesus. So, today's message of titled Eke Homo. Who actually knows what that means? It's all right if you're good at your Latin. All right. Who, who's? Hang on. Behold the man. Who said that? Very good, Lynn. Well done. Behold the man. Okay. I just want to spend some time looking at the scriptures in, in uh, Luke. Hopefully, as you've been, uh, you know, challenged over the last few weeks with Gary and um, putting things in place, you understand that homework is good to read your book of Luke. Um, all those feeling guilty, that's okay. Uh, Jesus loves to forgive. And then you can read it later when you get home. And uh, let's pray and ask for God's guidance in this message today. Lord, we're asking for you to come in and move into that place where your scripture comes alive. And the only way your scripture comes alive is with your spirit. And so, Lord, just as we've been singing this morning in this time of worship, asking for your spirit for a fresh, 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 fresh fire, for a fire in our hearts to burn because it's, it's so much that our spirit is longing for your spirit. So as we read this, help us to understand what's actually taking place and understand what it means for us personally. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Behold the man. Behold the man. I'm going to get to this at the end of the passage, but behold the man. I want you to just process that. How, how, do, you, how do you see Jesus in your journey? Is, is he just a man or is he God or is he God and man together? And I want you to sit in that place and think about it. But as we come to Luke 22, I'm going to read this passage and you're going to see this whole staged um, positioning with, with Herod and Pilate, two that are enemies against each other, looking at Jesus and actually coming together. Two enemies that really didn't like each other. Herod, who was you know, this, this appointed king over the Jews with a, with a, a Jewish, um, half-Jewish background and he was the king and building all these monuments to himself and trying to be something special. Pilate being the Roman representative, Pilate being the, the, the governor around Judea and so one with Rome and one with his Jewish kingship, power-broking but really not for the faith journey. And so we find these two, you know, head, head to head with each other, now all of a sudden becoming friends, battling over Jesus. So let's have a look at this conversation that takes place. This begins in Luke twenty two sixty three, and it says, The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. Well, who were the men? The men were actually Caiaphas, the high priest. They took Jesus that night from the Garden of Gethsemane, took him to, uh, to the high priest's house. And if you go to Jerusalem today, you go down uh, in, in Caiaphas' house, below the ground, there's, there's these room, and it's a, it's a room that you can only lower somebody in from the top. It's a dugout hole. 
and it's believed Jesus was put in this dugout hole for the night. So they would have taken him out in the morning and this is what they did. They beat him. They blindfolded him and they demanded and they said, prophesy who hit you. And they said many other insulting things to him. So that's already the, the, the Jewish religious leaders and, and the, the guard, the Jewish religious leaders, guards who already beat him. But then they take him at daybreak, 66, at daybreak, the council of the elders, uh, and of the elders people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they met together and Jesus was led before them. And this is where they go to... Um, to challenge in front of all the religious leaders, they say, if you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. And Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We've heard it from his own lips. And then the men of the whole assembly rose and they led him off to Pilate. So all the religious leaders have challenged him about who he is, who, they, who he's saying he is or what they believe he's saying he is, and so they've had enough, so they bring him to Pilate. So from the Jewish leadership, they're now bringing him to the Roman leadership. So they bring him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against him. But they insisted, He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. So obviously Pilate doesn't want to deal with Jesus. So when he had learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, that Herod was in charge of that area up north in Galilee, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him from what he had heard about him. He hoped to see him perform some sign or some sort of a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they'd been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And he said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I've examined him in your presence and have found no basis for charge against him. Neither has Herod. For he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. And, and the one they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. So we have this whole positioning. Remember coming into this place, uh, I kept mentioning to you on their way to Jerusalem. Remember Jesus was showing all these different signs and miracles, but moving from Galilee to Jerusalem. 
And every time he says, and we're on our way, or stated we're on our way to Jerusalem, it meant that Jesus was on his way to the cross. And now we find him in front of the Jewish, uh, the Sanhedrin, or the, the leaders, standing in front, and they're challenging him about his place of calling himself the, the king or a messiah. Now you find him also in front of Pilate, and Pilate, who really didn't want to deal with Jesus, really didn't want to have that place. Now, the reason the, the Jewish leaders had to go to Pilate, because they wanted Jesus killed. But because the Romans had control over that place, the Romans had control about who lives and who dies, or who can give a death penalty. So they had to, by law, bring Jesus to the Romans, so the Romans could actually say, yes, we will inflict the death penalty, we agree with you. Now, Rome's saying, no, we can't, because, well, Pilate's saying, no, I, I, don't want to, I don't want his blood on my hands. So then he finds out that Jesus is from Galilee, a Galilean, so he says, well, come on, let, let's let Herod deal with it. So here's an interesting thing, because when Jesus goes to Herod, Herod challenges Jesus, and Jesus doesn't say a word. You can think about that for a moment. Why doesn't he say a word? Uh, you know, these questions are posed. Have you ever thought, you know, just even Jesus, even in his own heart? Remember, this is the Herod that took John the Baptist's head, that had John the Baptist killed, head taken off. Remember, John was Jesus' cousin. Imagine what Jesus really wanted to say to him. <laughs> But I think there's more than that. Herod had no real authority. I think Jesus wasn't even going to go into that place. You have, you have no authority in this case at all. And then you find, it's almost Herod saying, it's almost like, you know that king that sits there with, with, with someone and say, Jesus, perform signs for me, you know? It's almost like, Jesus, you're, you're my jester. Come and entertain us. And then we find that the chief priests are yelling abuse at Jesus and challenging him in front of Herod, and Jesus is totally silent. And then we find Jesus back in front of Pilate. And Pilate is in that position, constrained by the people, trying to appease the people. And Pilate is in a position where he's really got no choice. Well, he did have a choice but he ends up going with the people. So this is what I want to bring into our, our thinking in the message because this is where we pick up in John 19. In John 19, I want you to picture this in your mind. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now it just states flogging, but you know it's 30 lashes. You know it's, it's, um, it's lashes that have cut him to pieces. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, put on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe. And they went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Now remember, Jesus has predicted this. We already talked about this weeks ago. Jesus had predicted this was going to happen. Then it says, once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Even though Pilate's had him flogged, even though Pilate's had let the soldiers do whatever they wanted to do with him, still seeing him as innocent, and then in verse 5, when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns, and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. Verse 6, As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! What's going on? Verse 5, When Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns, purple robe, Pilate said to them, he is the man, in Latin, eke homo, which means in the Greek to English, behold the man. Here's 
Pilate bringing out Jesus, crown of thorns on his head, ripped skin because of the beating up in a purple robe and says, Here, behold the man. Behold the man. What do you do with that in your own thinking? What do you do with that in your own mind? Behold the man, Jesus standing there, torn, crown of thorns, um, in one of the scriptures holding a a stick like a scepter in a purple robe. Totally mocked. How do you see it? Behold the man in your own heart. How do you see this scripture? How do you see Jesus standing there? And we find that when in verse 6 it says, as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him standing there like that, they still in their heart said, crucify, crucify. Behold the man. What are you doing with this scene in your own mind? What are you doing with this scene in your own mind? When you read that, what are you doing in your own mind knowing that Jesus, our Lord, standing there in front of the crowd, no one next to him, no one there to defend him, even his closest disciples, even those he's performed miracles for, standing there on this place and yet the crowd and the religious leaders who should have known who he was yelling, crucify, crucify. What have you done with this in your own mind? Have you humanized him? When you see Jesus, is he just a man? Have you humanized him? You just see him as a man. Only human, just a man. Or have you dehumanized him and said, he's just God, he is God? There are so many heresies that we can go, we won't go through them today, but some heresies see Jesus just as a man, born as a man, moved up into deity. There's other heresies that just see Jesus as just a spirit, stating that, well, he wasn't actually really a man. He was only a spirit getting around, so he didn't actually die. Have we humanized him and we only see him as a man? Have we dehumanized him and just see him as God and spirit? Or have you been able to go, yes, he's not only human, he is God at the same time. And that's what our Christian faith requires that place to be. Do you see him as a king? When he stood there with that scepter and, and that crown of thorns, when he, when he had the purple robe and he's been, did you see him as a king? Did you see him as a king in your head? Or do you see him as a king in your heart? Do you see him as a king? And if it's your heart, does your heart beat in such a way that you see him in every part of your being and understand that he's so central to who you are? That as your heart beats, your heart beats knowing that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. That he's not just a human, but he is God. Do you see that? Do you understand that? Do you make your choices during the day, your heartbeat during the day, do you make your choices understanding that God is your Lord and your Savior, that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, that your decision making, that your processing, that how you use your time is in that place where you see Jesus having all authority in kingdom, all authority in heaven and earth. Because there's a question going to be posed that a place of accountability, how you're using your day, your time, how you're making your decisions, how you're processing things, how you're seeing the world around you. That place of accountability. What you do with your, your worship 
I want to read you a story. I want to read you a story written by a guy called Richard Harvey. Who's Richard Harvey, you may ask? Richard Harvey was an alliance minister. Richard Harvey's son, John Harvey, planted this church. So John Harvey planted this church and his father, Richard Harvey, wrote this book called 70 Years of Miracles. If you ever want to read it, you're welcome to have a read of it. But I want to read one story in here. And I want you to think about this, even in your own journey. He went to Africa on a, on a mission um, journey. He went to Upper Volta and he met one of the most unforgettable characters that he's ever encountered. This is written from him. He visited a missionary and in whose home, he says, in whose home I stayed for the first night and said, and he said to me, Harvey, there's a tribesman in the country you ought to meet. Well, let's meet him, says Harvey. Oh, it's uh, not that easy. He lives a full day's journey from here. The roads are rough and he might not be, uh, even be alive. He's a very aged and I've not heard from him for many months. By the way that you talk, it makes me want to take the chance. Can we go tomorrow? As we travelled, the missionary told me the man's story. When he was 21, he sent for the village elders and they met in front of the Palava hut. He took his bag of religious paraphernalia and dumped it out on the ground along with his many fetishes. So those of you who have, uh, know a bit more of, the, uh, say, the Afri African villages and in many village places... There's um, a whole bunch of religious items that they have, spears and things that they do sacrifices with. They have fetishes like um, the witch doctor gives them um, leather belts and beads and things like that. It's supposed to all be protection from evil spirits. And so a lot of people are superstitious, so they, they have all these things to protect themselves. But he's brought them and he's thrown them on the floor. And this is what, this is what he does in front of his whole village. He throws them on the floor. Then he says... He says this, I have no confidence in any of these. He says, there's someone up there, and he's pointing to the sky, who made the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees and the animals. And he made me. And I want to worship him. No one has told me about him, but I'm sure he's up there. Don't you love that faith place? Now, listen to this. Therefore, for 10 years, every morning at sunrise, the young man went out in the tall grass outside the village, lifted his eyes up towards the heavens, and lifted his arms up, and he cries out this. He says, Oh, you up there, whoever you are, I worship you. So after 10 years of daily praying and seeking, a Muslim teacher heard about him and came to live with him. The teacher told him about Allah and read the Quran to him. Then one day, very abruptly, he turned to the teacher and he said, You can leave. This Allah you are telling me about in, uh, is not the man in the sky that I'm praying to every day for, more, for many more years. For every day for many more years, this man continued to pray each morning. Oh, you up there, whoever you are, make yourself known to me. I want to worship you. Then a Catholic priest heard about this, a uh, man who prayed so faithfully. So he came to live with him and teach him. He told him about the God of the Bible, about God sending his son, Jesus Christ, and about Christ's death on the cross as payment for our sins. After a little more than two weeks, the man said to the priest, The story you tell about your God in the sky and his son Jesus being sent into the world sounds sweet, and I like the words of the book you read to me. Somehow I believe it might be true, but you can go now. I don't like the things that you do. Things I would not do if I believe in the man of the book as you say you do. So the priest went away. More than five years passed, finally, a missionary 
was told about the man in the distant town. He went to inquire and he found him easily because the man was well known. The missionary read from the same book as the priest had. As he did so, the man's face lit up. I've heard that book before. The missionary told him the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. Oh, this man in the skies is alive now. Yes, and the missionary went on to explain his ascension and promised return. In a matter of only a few days, the seeker of many years had opened his life to Jesus Christ. When I saw him, he was very old. His hair was white as snow. The wrinkles in his face were so deep that one might place his fingers into the furrows. His aged eyes could not distinguish um, light from dark. Every morning, his wife placed him outside their mud hut on a mat and with only a roof of grass and banana leaves to shelter him from the hot African sun. When we arrived, the missionary spoke his, and his, name, uh, the missionary spoke his name and this old man's face lit up. The old man recognized the missionary's voice. After they had conversed briefly, he reached up and took a piece of paper from just above his head, which had a page from the New Testament. He proceeded to quote it, and then he returned it to its place. Then he found another piece of paper, rubbed his hand over it, and it was a songbook. Then he tried to sing in his quavery, cracked voice. But before we left, his head turned in the direction of the missionary's voice, and he asked, Teacher, would you have that young man come close to me? Harvey says, I felt honoured because I was in my 50s. He reached out to find my body and he kept feeling me until he found my arm, then in my wrist, and he pulled me down to the ground beside him. Feeling around until his hands found the top of my head, he began to pray. Harvey states this, I've had many pray for me down through the years, great men of God, but never have I felt God's power so real as when this elderly African saint prayed for me. There seemed to be a current flowing from his body into mine. It's a wonderful story, but it's an accountability to you and I. Here's this man who gave up all the, 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 the African uh, fetishes and, and religious and superstitious stuff and said, I know there's a God up there. I don't know who he is, but I'm not stopping till I know who he is. And so as the years go past, and finally he's, he realizes that the God he's praying to is alive. Jesus is alive. And he's so excited. And that's been his journey. Do you see Jesus in that place? Do you see him standing there as king? Do you see that place where even this, this young African man drop everything else and every day go out and worship? Doesn't even know fully what he's worshipping, but he knows something. Where are you at? And this is where my accountability question keeps coming in. Where are you at in your faith journey? Is he every day to you? Do you see him as king every day to you? Do you see him in your heart every day to you? Are you in that place where it's such a personal journey? It's moved from your head to your heart. This is so important. So important. We can read the scriptures. We can read the stories. But it's so important to move him from your head to your heart, to see him in that kingdom place. Because one day he's coming back. Bit of a spoiler alert if you want to look at scriptures. But it's a hope that we have, that one day he's coming back and he wants to know, do you see him as king? Do you see him in his humanity? Do you see that the beauty of him coming, walking and talking and being human, and yet God at the same time means he can relate to us? And that's what we read, right? We need so much right now. A God that can relate to us so that we can relate to him. So in your own mind, Eke homo, behold the man. Let me pray. 
Behold the man, Jesus, you stood there. You stood there in front of the crowd. You stood in front of your creation. You stood in front of those who you loved passionately. You knew what you were going through. Your humanness was struggling so much. We know that through the garden. Take this cup from me. Your humanness was saying, I don't want to do this. The humiliation standing Behold the man in front of Pilate, being beaten, being abused, spat on and slapped. And you stood there and the crowd shouted, crucify. The hardest part about this message is, I probably would have been one standing there saying, crucify as well. And that's the challenge for each one of us because each one of us has a darkness in our own hearts that needs the light of you coming in. So Jesus, let your light shine in us. Let us say, behold the man and behold the king, the one who sits on the throne, who's praying for us right now that our faith will not fail. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I was back.